Right. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to introduce um, Gary Gerald, who um, is um, a graduate intern at the Career Development Center, and today is his last day. Um, and Sham Chirtweek, who was an intern with a graduate intern with us last semester, and who so kindly is coming back to present this workshop. So um, Gary and Shamshir, I'm gonna give it off to you guys. Sounds good. Uh, thank you guys for joining. And I, I'm not sure, I don't believe you guys were here last semester, but um, if you were, it's going to be a similar investigation into the writing process, as well as um, an availability of resources that you can use as a writer, whether it be creative, fiction, or nonfiction. So uh, like Jessica introduced, we're both students of Iona College, and we we uh, were involved with the graduate center. Uh, I'm sorry, with the center as interns, right? So we were graduate interns, and although I'm not an intern anymore, I really appreciated the experience of working at the Career Center because it allowed me so many opportunities and um, I learned. It was a great learning experience. Sort of taking that into my career choices, and of course, it's a pleasure to be back. So I hope this presentation really is beneficial for you as well. All right. Do I just roll into the first slide here? That's us over there. So the creative process of writing, it's different for everyone. That it can be applied to any, as I said, pretty much any kind of writing you're doing, be it creative, nonfiction, even sort of um, business oriented writing, but we're focusing more on creative and nonfiction. But for me, those areas can be broken down into three general creative processes, which is exploration of the work, researching the work and cutting the work. This isn't linear either, as I always stress, this is an ongoing process. It doesn't happen in any order. It's once you get into it, it's very, very organic. Sorry to interrupt, just, just as a, just so you guys know what to expect. So Gary is going through the creative process and he's going to be giving you an insight into the writing art, right? So how you can build your stories, build your characters, et cetera. And then the second section, which I will lead, will be concerned with uh, the process of getting your work out there or published, right? The resources you will need to use that can be very beneficial, networking, et cetera. So uh, that just, to give you a good guideline on what this presentation will provide to you. So sorry about that, Gary. Oh, that's no trouble. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the first creative process I'd like to touch here is exploration. Now, exploration of a work is just pretty much getting into it. It's exploring the universe you're building, even if that's a nonfiction work set in our universe or a vast fantasy science fiction universe, something that's Tolkien-esque, as I would refer to it, knowing what's in that universe, how things work, how people interact, what they think, what the culture is like, so forth and so on, is in integral, I would say, to building any kind of story, especially if you want to build one that's larger, something that's on the Lord of the Rings scale, Star Wars scale, Game of Thrones scale, et cetera. It's good. The only way I can describe it is you have to get into it. You have to really kind of live and breathe in that universe. And there's different ways to do this. Sometimes it's brainstorming and note-taking, my general rule of thumb is if you have an idea, if you like it, write it down immediately. The last thing you want to do is lose it. But there's no such thing as a bad idea when it comes to writing. You'd be surprised what turns out to be useful even months after you have the idea. Alternatively, I've also suggested people before they write short stories, take your characters, put them in settings that are different or unique, doesn't have to be published. You can, if you're writing in a hero of some kind, you can write a short story just a day in their life or interacting with different people or something from their past. You'd be surprised how much that builds up what you're um, writing. You can even do that just with the universe you're writing in. You can think of like if your story is set in a city like mine is, you can just write about the city, who lives in the city, what is the city's history, so forth and so on. You can also do this with less complex fl flash fiction. That's just like a few paragraphs, but it does help build that up. I also recommend exploring other mediums, which is take your characters into something that's outside of writing. I draw my characters a lot. I don't even necessarily post those drawings, but when I draw them, I find that I learn more about them. I often feel the characters are revealing themselves to me. I learn what they look like. I learn what their personalities are. It's kind of a weird symbiosis that I can't really explain unless you do it, but I very much so recommend exploring other mediums. It doesn't necessarily have to be drawing. You could do this through music. You can do this through any kind of art, really. It all flows together into a larger creative process. Yeah, and a note on short stories is that they, at times can be building blocks for bigger epics, right? So if you look at a lot of 
fictional epics like Lord of the Rings, etc., they've they've started from smaller works, right? So you had the Hobbit, you have uh, very the authors experimenting with their world and their characters, and it also takes less commitment when you are trying to write a big fictional world if you separate. Uh, the chapters where you separate the sequences into uh, into independent individual uh, journeys, right? Filler episodes in a TV show or something of that sort can be likened to a short story. So definitely play around with short stories if you are interested in writing something large or something uh, vast and you can't exactly start it at the moment or you don't know how to. I, mean, that's, I think that's really actually a good point because like, if you know a lot about Tolkien and it's weird we touch on Tolkien with that's probably because he is the best. Um, a lot of his work is almost like short stories strung together into a much larger work. Yeah. I think one of his works, and I always butcher the name because it's impossible to pronounce, like Similarion or something like that, is essentially a short story of, of the history of his world. I forget the order in which it was released, but that's more or less how he built it. Well, actually, he wrote the fake language first, then wrote the story, but most of us can't write a whole fake language. Tolkien was a wizard. <laughs> And on, it, on to the next point, in, in vain with exploring your world, research is also key. You want to research real world things just for the authentic, authenticity of your work. And that could end up exploring things you would have never have thought you would research. Like in my work, I've, I'm surprised how often I'm researching ancient cultures and their beliefs and their structures across the world because I'm interested in the authenticity of it. And very often I find myself looking up like the effects of poisons and things like that for the authentic nature, I swear. But it's also the same thing. You wanna do this almost in a form of sensitivity. You, If you're dealing with a culture that's not your own, you wanna represent them accurately. And that's just, along with the authenticity, just probably a better rule of thumb. You don't wanna create stereotypes for characters. At least that's my way of thinking on it. Yeah. And finally, which I often find to be people's least favorite, sorry, least favorite process is cutting. Um, very often when you go through your work, and I've noticed this with myself, don't think that your first draft is terrible and give up. You're going to be adding and removing a surprising amount. If you saw my first draft in 2017, so now the books would almost be unrecognizable between each other. But uh, at some point, as I've learned from other authors, you got to have no mercy. You got to read through it. You got to say, do I really need this? Is it really in line with the story? Is it too much of a side quest as it were? And if it's not important, you cut it. You can save it, but save it though. Save it as one of the flash fiction, save it in your notes because that can help build a lore. But definitely you have to get used to the um, cutting parts to make sure your work is not overly long, depending on the genre, which I think we'll get into in publishing. And just to make sure everything is concise, the story flows, things like that of that nature. Yeah. And I believe I'm handing it over to you here, Joshua, now. Okay, it right, sounds good. So uh, Gary is going through the writing process and he gave some very good insight into how you can build your stories, et cetera. So once that part is more or less completed or you're ready to share your work, uh, you need to start preparing for publication, right? There's a lot of avenues in this day and age, especially with the technological advancements and the uh, online medium that we have, it's, it's so accessible to share your work. But the traditional methods, which I'll go through, like agencies, publishing houses, they're still the foundations for getting a book out there, right? So, so I'm going to be primarily focusing on those, right? A lot of people say writing is an easy part because you can write, and then if nobody reads it, you, you know, that's uh, it's good to write for yourself. But if you're motivated in sharing your work, you should know the details on how to do that. Um, and it's not always about the books that get published aren't always the best books, right? It's more so that they were able to advertise it in a specific way, or they were able to create connections that help their book get out there. So don't be demotivated as well, especially in regards to rejections, which I'll talk about shortly as well. So the things you should be thinking about once you're ready to share your work is publishing, uh, finding an agency, uh, which is the next slide. I'll explain what, the, what a literary agent is, right? Literary journals, which are uh, online, right? There, there's submittable, uh, for example. Then there's contests, online contests, again, for various mediums, for novels, for short stories, poems, okay? And then websites for that you could create for yourself or create for your work, for your characters, okay? So Gary, if you don't mind going on to the next slide. First one, literary agents. I would say that probably the most effective uh, tool 
at your disposal for getting your work out there, okay? They are, in a nutshell, they're your partner, they're your supporter, they're your believer, and they can be an honest friend when it comes to talking about your work in a transparent way, okay? They, they are, the reason I say partner is because they only choose authors or writers that they like the work of, okay? And that's a successful agent is someone who takes, who has a dedicated genre or a dedicated style that they work with. Um, they see worth in advertising that person's uh, uh, work, okay? And that's why there's so many different literary agents with all diverse uh, interests. And there's there's an agent out there for every single type of writer, which is great. There, you know, it's a huge business, really. Um, it's usually the most important step because they open up publishing, right? So publishers don't always look at authors directly. They don't communicate with authors directly, especially in this day and age. There's probably thousands of submissions uh, on, on a daily basis to publishing houses, and they don't have the time to filter through who they want to work with, right? P publishers are concerned with business, you know, that they, they want to make money. So what they do is they get in contact or they work with a select few literary agents who represent different authors and the agents have a reputable reputation that can support the author right so if an agent comes to a publisher and says you know I, you publish my authors before you know how successful they can be i have this new author he just wrote a novel or she just wrote a novel and you'd like to work with your publishing house then the publishing house may see that as a worthwhile interaction and take the book into consideration okay so literary agents that is the first step uh, there is a link I put in the red, it's highlighted in red, it says literary data agents database. So if you go there, uh, I don't know if it'll open at the moment. Okay, so this is just one example of a database for literary agents. So Gary, if you could scroll down a bit, you could see a whole list of different literary agents from different agencies okay so these are not publishers and they're not from publishing houses they have their own literary agency which is comprised of more agents okay each agent has a specific uh, if you click on the agent you don't have to do that gary but if you click on the agent you will see a short bio of uh, where they come from what they are interested in representing who they have represented before for example representative authors Brittany ackerman Lawrence bozore right these are all authors that have published before and that sort of advertising the authors that you should work with me because I have made these authors popular. Okay, so save this link. Once you're done with your work, send out queries. So if you click on the author, they'll, they'll tell you how to send out queries, right? They'll be, uh, I, I want a short sample of your work. I want a bio. I want the purpose of your writing, etc. And it's, it's a very time consuming, but it is a worthwhile experience. And don't be demotivated by rejection you will be rejected at a at an alarming rate um you know but it's just it's, it's sort of like hitting hitting the spot uh, once it happens you you will feel uh, great about your work you'll feel a huge burst of motivation a huge burst of confidence uh, and it's not a matter again it's not a matter of quality it's more so a business so they are looking at it through that uh, through that scope you know is this book going to sell basically all right. So if you could go back to the slide. Okay. Like I said, it's still a business and they want to make sure that the authors they're working with are reputable. So for example, Dostoevsky, who's my favorite author, was a Russian author from the 19th century. His books will not be very, rep, uh, you know, they won't make a lot of money in this day and age. People don't read that sort of literature and it's it's rare, right? So it's sort of an academic book, consider, it's considered an, an academic book uh, or a, an academic author in this day and age. So the, the chances of him even finding a literary agent, especially in America, is rare. So again, it's not about the quality, it's about the, uh, basically quantity and how much money the author can make, okay? So if I can add quickly, a lot of it is, at least from my experience in both dealing with other writers and working in the books so I see what's popular, a lot of it's finding your niche yeah, and throwing it out there and seeing what sticks. But your if your niche is like small, you kind of have to expect your agents and kind of like the acceptance rates to be similar. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You have to be realistic about your output. Okay. Uh, you're writing romance, point. in which case you own like 50% of the market. <laughs> or you know, young adult fiction is, is probably one of the most popular genres at the moment. So you have a good chance. 
with that genre. All right, would you mind uh, going to the next slide? Okay. Sure. sure. All right, so publishers. What's the difference between a publisher and an agent? Like I was explaining before, agents work directly with the author and publishers work directly with the agent. Okay, so the agent is the middleman between the author and the uh, and the uh, publisher. Okay, uh, the publisher doesn't always want to deal with <laughs> the author, actually, because the author, they consider the author to be uh, too eccentric sometimes, right, too erratic. They, they want control over the work, whereas the publisher is concerned with how they can sell this work. Okay, so they, they work through the agent in that way, all right? Publishers offer advertisement, they offer the printing, they offer the listing, okay, so the the Pop, the more popular publishers like Penguin House, the more market, the more market exposure your book will have. So getting published Penguin House is a dream for many authors because they get a huge amount of advertising, they get a lot of revenue, they get uh, a lot of exposure. Okay, and then as the publishers slim down in terms of reputation, in terms of uh, uh, availability, in terms of uh, just popularity, the author also sums down in that way okay so for example i published a book in 2017 a short book and i worked with an indie publisher indie publishers are publishers that work directly with authors so that 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 has a lot of disadvantages okay and a lot of advantages and, and advantages that you can work with you can get your book out there without getting an agent a disadvantage is that the indie publishers are packed with authors. They're packed with a lot of authors and they don't have a specific genre that they work with. So they accept basically everyone who they think the book is, uh, is, is a good quality, okay? They have limitations in advertisement because they put so much money towards uh, basically advertising themselves, okay? And it's just not as much exposure. So when I wrote, when I published the book, it was with an indie publisher called Black Rose Writing. They didn't have basically any money for advertisement except for the website. They did have, however, connections with Amazon and Barnes and Noble because they were still an established publisher. So indie publishers, although they may seem, uh, you, you may be uh, hesitant to approach indie publishers, getting your foot in the door using an indie publisher is probably... Uh, it's, it's a great step, okay, because it does allow you access to something like Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I remember my book was, and I was able to order physical copies at my local Barnes and Noble. If you call them up and say, uh, can you order a couple of copies, they will physically order the books and put them on the shelves. So that was really great. And your publishers also usually have short contracts, maybe two years, three years, and it's up to you to uh, renew the contract and they also go off of sales right so if the book was on their shelves was on if the book was under their name for two years and it didn't do so well they may just cancel the contract and not offer you to renew it okay um, and then indie publishers uh okay so vanity publishers i do want to talk about those vanity publishers you have to be wary of okay the point of a publisher is that you don't pay any money to uh, to make your book, to sell your book, okay? You don't, you don't, I mean, I'm sorry, you don't spend any money, okay? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> you don't spend any money to publish your book. That is what a publisher does. They take care, they like your book so much and they think it's going to make so much money that they take on the expenses of publishing and turning it into a physical copy, getting in touch with stores like Amazon and splitting the revenue with them, right? And the author play, pays no fees in publishing their work. Vanity publishers prey on authors who want to get published and they, uh, they propose contracts like, okay, to work with us, we'll publish your book, but you have to buy 50 copies. And authors that are inexperienced or are so eager to get the work out there will read the contract and they'll say, okay, that's not so bad. Turns out they end up paying like $6,000, $7,000 to this publisher. And the publisher itself has no advertisement networks or anything. And although they will have a book published, they have all spent way too much money getting it out there, okay? Vanity publishers don't care about quality. They don't care about genre. They don't care about worth. They want to make money. So they will accept anybody. That is why they're looked down upon because uh, they're sort of using authors or eager authors as a business, okay? So be wary of that. A good way to no recognize vanity publishers is they'll often post advertisements. Publishers don't post, post advertisements for their publishing house, okay? People come to them. They, they, if they're reputable, people come to them. They won't be advertising you know send in your manuscripts send in your manuscript because they don't need to so if a vanity publisher is doing that it means they're trying to uh entice you into signing a contract with them 
So be very careful about vanity publishers. I think uh, me that, like just a few months ago, I had the whole issue with a vanity pub publisher as well. I remember we uh, went over this together. Yeah, it was like a publisher from Arizona, and they're like mm -hmm. trying to get me to buy, or my dad to buy like ten thousand copies yeah. of his existing book. Yeah. Yeah, so they do that. And, and it's unfortunate because a lot of authors will do that. They'll see it as a great way of getting exposure, but they don't have any exposure. The, the, you know, they're not going to go through the effort of putting your book out there. They, they may make a website and put the book on the website, but that's not going to sell you any copies because nobody knows who they are. So be careful with those. It's dangerous. Okay. Uh, would you mind going to the next slide? Good. All right, so literary journals and contests, these are online avenues you can take. These are uh, online um, submission portals, okay? Submittable is a great one. Uh, they're basically online journals and magazines that take monthly or annual submissions, okay? So you could, uh, they'll usually have volumes, monthly volumes or seasonal volumes that you can submit to. And they have a lot of submissions, but they are very generous with who they accept, especially if your work deals with a lot of modern socio-political issues uh they are the top topic right now in literary journals is that right so if you're if your writing is along those lines definitely look at literary journals online go to submittable.com and find um, so, uh, options find portals that are accepting annual submissions some of them charge money and the difference between vanity publishers and these literary journals is that the money goes directly to sustaining the foundation paying the reviewers who look at the work coming in and it's usually at most should only be five to twenty dollars for submission okay um that just helps them sustain their uh their outlook okay uh, it shouldn't go more than that if it does either they must be like the biggest literary journal in the world or in the country or they are just trying to get money off of you okay so uh, make sure to read how popular they are and see the reviews of those journals okay for literary journals they're very precise and narrow for what they want like i was talking about with the issues like social political issues right so you need to find your niche you need to find what you need to find literary journals that are best targeting your audience okay there's a lot of journals out there some deals with uh, a, a big topic th today is women's issues so if you're writing deals directly with that topic uh literary journals will uh, the chance of you getting accepted by a literary journal is very high all right, so read what they're looking for and write your work according to that, or just simply tweak your work according to what they're looking for. Right, they, there's different journals for styles, uh, prose, uh, or minimalism. Right, some journals love minimalism and hate prose, and vice versa. So also be wary of that. And the last one, yes, yeah, so submittable.com. Gary, if you wanted to just go there really quick. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, last semester I was able to sign in, but basically once you sign in, it's a, uh, I would say a database or, a, uh, yeah, a database for various uh, submission uh, portals. Okay. Different journals are opening up submission portals to their contests and each, and you could just filter it down. If you want to submit two poems, if you want to submit short stories or novels, it'll filter down and you could also put no fee. If you don't have any money, they'll, they'll give you free alternatives that journals that aren't asking for uh, fees for submitting to their journals, right? And they're usually quick, they'll get back to you within a, a week to a month's time, unless they say otherwise, it'll take a couple of months. And it's just a good way of practicing your submission skills, your tuning your work, right? They'll give you some of them get feedback, which is amazing. Um, so definitely go to Submittable, make an account, and just start submitting things and you'll get a lot of rejections like i said but don't be demotivated you the chances of you getting accepted are low but it's possible and it's a great feeling once you do all right gary would you mind going to the slide all right. and, and just you know i put the link in the chat okay um great, great. and that it's like it's a link to the page to create the free account okay all right sounds good so let me click that real quick if it doesn't load i'll just uh just give me one second guys i'm gonna because it would be great if you guys could see sorry i didn't even think about that that they would ask for logging in okay all right so i got in uh, uh what i can do is i can screen share if that makes it easier for everyone yeah that's okay gary yeah um you can share them okay. so i just hit stop share here it'll take over yeah so i'll do submittable or submittable right there okay so let me know if you guys see this 
Do you guys see submittable? Right now, it's still the message. Oh, there. Now it's okay. there. All right. So, uh, so this is basically my personal submission portal, right? So it shows you, like you can see, decline, decline. There's a whole bunch of declines. Some uh, one's in progress, one is received, right? And this is normal. This is how uh, basically everyone's submission portal will look like, right? Because our literary journals are still specific with what they want. So let me go into Discover. Okay, let me go into Discover. Just give me a second, it's loading. Okay. So Discover Opportunities. This is the availability of the submissions. So you have Adventure Cyclist Magazine, you have poetry submissions, uh, blog submissions, visual artwork. So they don't just deal with writing, they also deal with other arts, $300 short story fiction and nonfiction contest. So let me pick one of them. Beyond Words is a pretty good one. Uh, they're reputable and submittable. Beyond Words, they tell you what they're looking for. We read submissions of poetry, short fiction, nonfiction. Accepted pieces will be included in the issue 31 of Beyond Magazine, October 2020. Submitters will receive three complimentary digital copies of the magazine, of course, and, uh, they, and sometimes there's even prizes for the top three submissions. Click on it. Let's say you want to submit there. Just give me a second. It's loading. Okay, so you just want to submit there. They'll ask for the title of your piece. Like I said, $15, which is sometimes a, a normal submission, especially because Beyond Literary, it's a pretty it's a pretty popular submission portal on Submittable, probably one of the biggest. So title of your piece, work, they allow you to submit up to three poems or a story, and then a short bio for who you are and your work as well. Okay, so definitely save this link. Uh, it's very important and it helps with a lot of uh, different, a lot of different things. So, okay, uh, actually, I'm going to give you the control back. Just give me one second. How do I stop sharing? I just the red button. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, there we go. So, Gary, okay, if you want to continue. All right. And then websites, uh, create your own personal websites, not so much for exposure because the chance of somebody coming across your website is low but for your submissions so a lot of uh, uh like beyond words they may ask for personal websites so they can go especially agents love this agents will ask for your personal website so when you create a personal website with your different works your your pictures your uh history writing history agents who are interested in your work may, may want to go to that website and see what else you offer or you know uh, your foundations of your writing identity. Uh, there's a lot of different avenues you can go. There's Wix site, there's Google websites, right? So whatever's with, within your budget and uh, to your style, I would say go to uh, go go that route as well. Create a website um, and don't publish entire manuscripts only because one you you also want to make money and nobody's you know you don't want to put it out there for free. You don't want to just leave it out there because people will take it and um, it, it's also intriguing, right? So if, if someone really likes work, they'll have three chapters, but if they want to read more of it, they may want to buy it, right? So you don't want to put everything out there for free. And all right, you could go to the next one. I believe that may end my section, but let's see. Okay, yeah, so these are just the resources. It includes everything we've talked about, uh, submittable, uh, uh the database literary database okay uh so it, all everything that you need will be posted here right so world building for example what gary's talking about and if gary if you want to go again a little deep in detail through uh, world anvil which you did last semester i think that's that was really helpful as well so generally speaking i have um all of these are tremendous tools but these two in particular are probably the most in-depth which is World Anvil and Storyblocks. I'll show you both. We're gonna start with World Anvil here. So World Anvil, for those of you who have ever you know, tried Dungeons and Dragons, originally it was a tool for Dungeons and Dragons. But as time went on, they expanded into this just unbelievably powerful tool for authors. It lets you make profiles, Wikipedia-esque stuff, like as you can see on the corner here. You can have the stats, overviews of the characters. And what sticks out to me more than anything else is it allows you to make interactive maps. Now this can be useful for yourself for writing. So you can, as I said, like for me, my the city is a character in my story. I'm very into the city. The more I learn about the city, the more I wanna write. 
So having a tool like this where you can see the country, the city, the state, the village, whatever, and not just see it, but also add like these little points of interest, which themselves can link to the articles about places, characters, or events, just helps the overall quality of the work, makes it feel more real. And just like, it, it helps you get into the universe as it were. It makes the whole idea of it not seem unprofessional, not seem like a fan fiction. It, it makes it a serious work. Yeah. So it looks fun too, creating your own world and experimenting with it. Would, you know, it just seems like a fun thing to do. <laughs> Similarly, and I've seen this used to great effect, is another website called Storyblocks. This is something I discovered recently. There's a guy on YouTube, I think his name is like Austin McConnell or something like that. And he is um, an author and he has his own unique take on things. He's trying to create a cinematic universe for royalty-free superheroes from the 30s. But what I've seen him do is he actually takes a lot of the stock footage, stock music and stock um, pictures, and he makes these very high quality stories using these images to create kind of like a background mood. I think he did a horror story using just the videos from this site and the immersion that I saw was kind of unbelievable. All of this is like, it's not free. There is a small subscription fee, but the quality and the effect that it can have on your work is really, it can improve it a lot, especially if you want to build a website. I say that goes for both World Anvil and Storyblocks. It can just add that level of professionalism, makes it seem real, doesn't make it seem like it was made in HTML in the 90s, all those kinds of good things. But there's a few other sites here too. I believe these are yours here, Shamsu. Yeah, the literary agents. Um, yeah, Submittable is there as well. So definitely look through these in your own time, uh, play around with them. Don't get some, you know, subscriptions. Of, they might may offer free subscriptions, but if, you know, make sure you know what you're signing up for. Um, but just keep in mind, you will at some point spend money in one way or another, either through submission. It's very difficult to work, to navigate through this art without putting some sort of money out there. You just have to figure out what your budget is and work along those lines, okay? Uh, submissions to agents are usually free. In fact, I think they have to be free. So I will just get started on that. If you're ready to share your work, just start sending out agents, right? Um, it's a free thing and you'll hear back within a couple of months. Um, they sometimes give you feedback. And if they, if you don't hear back, it's a, you know, it's, it's okay that they, they have so many submissions, they don't have time to reply back all the time. Um, so don't get demotivated during this entire process. Just honestly, this is what we do as writers. You, you know, you live your life and on the side, you're exercising your literary minds, right? And uh, everything is a learning experience. As I, as I so often say, nothing worthwhile is easy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dostoevsky, again, I'm going to use him, but he wrote Crime and Punishment when he was probably in the lowest point of his life. He was uh, he was just got out of jail. He had no money. Oh, I mean, he was a gambler as well, so he struggled with that. <laughs> you know, but uh, he, you know, he wrote Crime and Punishment and it became one of the biggest books in the history of literature. And he was he was living on the street at that time, right? And a lot of authors struggle in that way as well. They, they have great minds, but they weren't always the best, you know, managers. And this is where later agents come in, they take care of all of that for you. So don't worry if you feel like you're lost. Your job is to write and just try and get in touch with agents and submission portals and things of that sort. And I think that even goes for my man Tolkien as well. Almost all of his works were loosely inspired by his experience in the Battle of the Somme. So. You never know what's going to inspire your work, and yeah, you just gotta. I guess you gotta keep going through it. Yeah, and the, yeah, the, if you're a writer, you have to leave your house. You have to, you know. I think the stereotype is that writer just stay inside and write all day. If that's the case, your work is not going to be so in depth, right? You're not going to have really any knowledge of the world. You're not going to know how people interact with each other. So leave your house, go for a walk. You'll see little things that you can start incorporating into your work. Uh, go on work experiences, go on relationship experiences, right? All of this is going to help build a sort of realism in your work and, give, and bring it a huge level of depth that you won't otherwise have if you do just stay indoors and just write all day. Um, you may be a great writer, but there's a limitation to how much you can actually see and, and implement from the real world if you don't see the real world. So that's another piece of advice I would give. You'd be surprised where inspiration comes from, and you'd be surprised if you look back, a lot of your characters are going to be meshes of other characters mm -hmm. and people you know. Yeah. I also just getting it out there. Do not be disturbed if you like are writing and you think your writing is somewhat similar to another book. Yeah. There's nothing new under the sun as long as your take is original. That's yeah. more important. Everything is a as 
more serious authors have studied, almost every story is a retelling of the same few stories and forms. Yeah. So that's kind of advice that I had and that bothered me in the beginning. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people try to be experimental, but honestly, most great literature is just retelling subplots and, and interactions and dynamics between people, right? That's the most interesting thing you could do is writing about how characters are working with each other. And that's just a repeating pattern in human history. It's just psychology that you will see the same sorts of uh, relationships happening and, and, and uh, tensions between them. So don't worry about that. All right, so I think now we can open it up to any questions that you may have, uh, feel free.